Okay. So my, my talk, it's not really a paper yet, it's a talk. <laughs> my talk is the Folger, the first, fo the first folio 400, 400, and the Shakespeare Industrial Complex. Okay. I read Gabriel's paper and was so impressed by it and was doing some similar work on it and I just decided no, he did the best job. So, <laughs> so this, is a little, this is a lot different. And this is a little more informal, so. And I promise to be sort of quick. Okay. They say Shakespeare would not exist if it were not for the first folio. So here we are again, out on the fringes of this lovely town that pro probably would not exist in this form without Shakespeare. This presentation draws on recent writings from the first folio by Ox, on the first folio by Oxfordians and Orthodox scholars. I'm taking off where I left off with my 2016 article and my follow-up Boston 2016 presentation on the first folio tour when they sent all of their when the folder sent um, a copy to libraries or museums in all 50 states um, for the whole, for a little while, for like two months for each one or a month for each one in all 50 states. <clears throat> then I had found that the tour made it very clear that the folder is not neutral on the authorship question. They, they claim to be neutral and they treat us scholars who visit there very well. We enjoy doing work there, but what we come out with, they ignore. Um, they just don't give us any respect about what we do. So um, they, they really never intend to be anything, and, and really to be neutral on the question. And if anything, Things have gotten a little bit worse. Okay. Whoops. Two ahead. Sorry. Okay. You see where I am. Make sure I. Okay. Sorry. This is a, the. I'm, I have a Mac like this too, and it's a little. Mine's. A, mine you push a little lighter. So if I push too hard, that's probably why. <laughs> okay. Um, Just a second. Okay, so um, S SOF sponsored the first Folio 400 celebration volume that Roger's editing and curating with existing and new Oxfordian material for the tentatively called the Shakespeare Enigma Machine. Um, and I'm helping with that too. Um, so as it is appropriate, we start with a British scholar on that momentous day that may or may not be the Shakespeare birth moment, April 23rd. I'm going back to an earlier couple of Folger events. The Folger holds a birthday lecture every April 23rd by an eminent Shakespearean. Brian Cummings gave the 2014 birthday lecture at the Folger entitled Shakespeare, Biography, and Antibiography. Cummings' lecture is a tour de force of Stratfordian rationalization. The professor from York Uni summed up in his title, a major conflict between Shakespeare doubters and Stratfordians. His lecture had also opened the Folger Institute's NEH funded collaborative research conference on Shakespeare and the problem of biography, part of the Folger's celebration of the 450th anniversary year of Shakespeare's birth. Oxfordian, Oxfordians were there. We were sort of pre-censored as discussion of the authorship question was totally taboo and not allowed. Um, but we were there. 
I'm not sure we will ever get into another conference like that because there were like five or six of us and we caused a lot of trouble. So, so um, I'm not sure that will ever happen again. But um, the conference made it very clear what we already knew. They have a problem with biography and they know it but chose to ignore it. Okay, so um, in his birthday, um, his kind of recycled lecture for the birthday lecture of 2014 that he'd already given um, in March. Okay, you know, it's hard to write two talks in one month. I, I give him that. Okay, he said, the first folio outgrew its author. It is the first folio that now best represents the life. Indeed, in an important sense, the life of Shakespeare is posthumous. As an act of hom homage and mourning, his friends turned him into a book. His friends did it. And the book still lives among us. My argument in brief is that we respect this fragmentariness of historical memory and also return to the literary, return to the book itself. Okay. What? Yeah, you read most of this, you're like, what? <laughs> okay. All right. I am mostly sticking to the Folger here, but I wanted to summarize, oops, sorry. That's gonna come in a minute. <laughs> sorry. Um, if I push the button, I go off of my notes and onto the next slide, so I'm sorry about that. I'm mostly sticking to the Folger here, but I wanted to summarize points that Gabe examined in more detail. The Folger's selective, and I shall so, so add, superficial treatment of obvious vexed evidence amounts to cherry picking. He minimizes Ben Johnson, taking him only literally. They minimize him. They promote him as an envious oddity. They exaggerate the roles of Hemings and Condal, which Gabe explains so well. They were really in no position to edit anything. I found also, I found some other interesting stuff about Hemings and Condal, but um, I think Gabe covered it so well. Rarely, they rarely shows um, this, they rarely show this, whoops, dang name, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> let's see, I got to go back two slides, if you hit the wrong button, you're in big trouble, oops, now it's going forward, okay. I've had this happen before, but I'm not letting it bother me this time. Okay. All right, now I have to click over here. All right. Catching up. It makes the notes about size 25, so you have to... <laughs> okay, so they rarely show the, the spread of the book like this. In, in many of the folios, it's in a different order sometimes because they added, like Gabe was telling us, they added pages, they changed pages, they changed the order in a lot of the folios um, over the years before, you know, before they kind of were stuck in a library where nobody could do anything to them. And so you don't always see this juxtaposition as it was intended. Um, and they also, you know, that kind of ignores what's going on here, which is, as Roger has shown, is pretty interesting. Um, the, the cipher, I'm referring to the Charlotte Armstrong cipher in that poem. He has a great video on that if you haven't seen it. Um, it also ignores, the Folger also ignores the patron, Earl Dedicates. They never said a word about them on the tour. They were totally excluded, even though they may have paid for it, helped pay for it. Um, it also ignores the Drozschutz bizarreness, the very strange image there, and that they don't even act like it's an issue, and it, even their own scholars have said it's an issue. And last but not least, the authorship question is not really even a thing at the Folger anymore. Okay. All right, the Drozschutz. The Dress Out title page is a very popular image everywhere, though. You see it everywhere else. Um, you can even put it on your second best bed if you want.
beyond the dubious biography-related claim that the first folio preserves the controversial Drozhout engraving as one of the author's only authentic likenesses, looks exactly like him, we swear, um, <laughs> the Folger evades rather than encounters questions about authenticity and authorship, and even, even this claim of the posthumous Drozhout's authenticity has never been proven, still hotly disputed, and even, even among traditionalists. So what's, what's up with that? It's just some, you know, something to avoid talking about. Okay, let's see if I can get this to... Okay. Meanwhile, the, the, the Folger is boxed up and in storage. <laughs> This is the reading room full of all the stuff, some of the stuff that's probably downstairs where they had to move everything um, to build the new building. I'll explain a little bit more about that. Also, <laughs> we can't compete with this. <laughs> that's obvious. The, the Shakespeare Industrial Complex. <laughs> so. Um, They've raised $51.5 to refer, to redo their building, uh, which is still going on, and um, to redo their offices across the street and various programs um, that are going to happen. Okay. This is the original building. Um, very nice picture of it. Um, one of it's one of several buildings designed by the French-born Philadelphia architect Paul Cret. The Folger Shakespeare Library was designed to house the greatest collection of its kind in a building that spoke both to the Renaissance architectural forms of Shakespeare's time and the monumental classicism of the U.S. Capitol and Supreme Court buildings. No pressure for Mr. Kratt. Creating an architectural language that spanned these two very different contexts was not very easy, yet Kret somehow managed to create something beautiful and elegant on a scale quite different from the great buildings that surround it, i.e. the Library of Congress and the Supreme Court, um, even if somewhat housing some, something somewhat less judicious. <laughs> okay, so... Anymore. Okay. Unfortunately, the old building, we've been, Roger and I have been there several times. Roger did his seminal work on, on the um, Geneva Bible there. And so it's very important to Oxfordianism as well. Don't get me wrong. You can learn, I learn something new every time I go there. There, Folger collected everything that had to do with research with Shakespeare research, not just Stratfordian stuff. He collected authorship stuff too. So all that stuff is there as well. So, because as I hinted in my last um, talk in 2016, it's very possible that um, right before his death, Folger was actually leaning toward Oxfordianism because he, he gave up Bacon and at the same time, he was buying the manuscript of um, Esther Singleton's um, Oxfordian novel in manuscript um, right before he died. And then her sister sent it to the Folger, and it's there. And I got it out. Nobody had really looked at it before, apparently, because it's wrapped in the same brown paper package that Esther, that Edith Singleton that Esther Singleton wrapped it up in to, to be sent to Folger, and then both Folger and Esther died before it went to the Folger. And it has her handwriting on the thing. So it was, de it was kind of predetermined. That, you know, they say, oh, that was, that was arranged after he died. No, it was arranged before he died. So that's kind of interesting. OK. It was pretty inaccessible for modern people in terms of inclusion for the handicapped, as well as impractical for the Folger's newer ambitions and messaging. It was getting a little small and tight, so, and, you know, a little bit old, so. But 51 million, okay. 
Let's see. Okay. This is um, two elevation studies for the Folger Shakespeare Library by Kret. Um, he designed it to look like a book, perhaps, or a bookshelf with beautiful Art Deco doors and windows. Kret had also designed, strangely enough, the memorial to um, the World One dead in France, which the folder kind of resembles just a little bit of architectural history here and fascinated, fascination of mine. That's, whoops, sorry, I went too fast. <laughs> That's the world, you see the resemblance <laughs> between the two buildings. So um, we have to remember that this is a pre-Nazi building and that the Nazis actually appropriated this culture this architectural culture for their fascist needs. So I don't think of Kret as a kind of fascist architect. Because <laughs> so, he was in the, you know, he was designing this in 1932. Okay, but now, now this is what's going on. Shakespeare's kind of left the building because I'm sure all this jackhammering probably drove him completely, would, would, have, would have driven Devere at least completely insane. So, um, and this is what they're doing to the building. Like they didn't have anywhere to go out, so they went under. They had a little bit of room beside to go out. They moved the gigantic, um, magnolia tree that was in the way, which was an industrial um, proposition itself. It was a, but they moved it to preserve it. They moved it back to the back. It was in the front, sort of, what I consider the front. So they're adding, um, the white on this diagram is the historic footprint. So they're adding all the stuff on the top. Um, and um, two, or two big layer. They want an exhibition hall with a high ceiling, so um, they had to they had to um, kind of excavate under the existing building to do this. So it's going to be pretty um, impressive. They didn't really have a good exhibition hall, and they need more space for books because. I read somewhere that they haven't even cataloged everything that Folger collected. Some of it is still in the crates that he stored it in. So, I mean, it's just amazing. But, um, and, you know, God knows what's in those crates. So, let's we'll be glad to see that. So, it'll look like this. Um, I should have stayed on the last slide just a little bit better, but I won't go back. The good thing about this for them is they had a tiny little books, little gift store. Now they're gonna have a gigantic, a nice big gigantic gift shop. And if any of you've um, kind of watched some documentaries, you might have might have seen Exit Through the Gift Shop. <laughs> you know the art world. You know um, this is kind of akin to the art world valuation of things. That you know it's all about it's all about the gift shop. <laughs> so, all right. Especially when it costs fifty-one million. <laughs> okay, so they needed a better gift shop. They also, um, okay, I'll be a little more thorough here. Um, let me make sure I am in the right place. Okay, the new exhibition spaces will inclu include a display of a large number of the Folgers' eighty-six first folios. So they're actually going to have their fo first folios. Behind glass, of course. You <laughs> can't have people just grabbing them. <laughs> so, yeah, if you remember, one of the last ones that sold at auction went for $10 million, So protecting $50 million to prevent all those millions might be useful. Okay. Um, but they've kind of lost in kind of um, typical Folger uh, history. They've kind of lost sight of some things. This is one of the nice um, exits. Um, and of course, that's um, the, the, pre the president and, um, the, and Plimpton um, coming out of the Folger. So pretty, pretty 
heady stuff. Um, and that was the Art Deco door. Now, what they've done, what they did, which is kind of interesting, they un. That's this is where the gift the gift shop was. That's the door that's right there. That's the same thing. The one on the right is now. This is the old. So they were re refurbishing the building, but you can't use those doors anymore. So they're because they're fragile. They're kind of like Frank Lloyd Wright kind of stuff. That that glass will fall apart if people slam those doors all the time. So um, so they're not going to use that. Uh, they're not going to use that entrance, but they've uncovered it. So it was kind of interesting that they had covered up some of the most beautiful things about their heritage right there just to have the gift shop. <laughs> okay. And then that little um, niche on the left in the, the right-hand photo had, is it, was actually an original HVAC H duct. So um, they've been kind of oblivious to their own history when it comes to priorities like the gift shop. And while they were working on renovations and restorations, they, uh, they uncovered the AC vent and found that it had very beautiful Art Deco, like an Art Deco grill on it. And, but they had covered it up. And so, you know, covering up an AC vent might explain some of the hot air the Folger has been capable of. <laughs> but my point is they, they, they don't even know what they've got sometimes. Okay, so another, th whoops, sorry. So another thing in my previous presentation, I'd explained that uh, what were then problems with the Folgers FAQ or frequently asked question page with regard to authorship, this remains and has not really changed for the better. Um, it kind of started out as um, a quote by um, Michael Whitmore, the director. Um, so, it, But it's been changed in a recent upgrade to their website in 2020. The form of this question alone is awkward. Almost no, no uninitiated person would ask this question this way, as we know. We're the ones who ask this question. <laughs> Not only is the question circular in his logic, as we can see here, it also misrepresents the authorship situation. Stratfordians are reluctant to admit that Shakespeare and Shakespeare may not be the same thing. It also eliminates the search or keyword term authorship. So if you're searching for this, it might not come up. If we read on, it gets worse. No. Okay. You see what it says? Um, the Folger, this is what it said in 2016. The Folger has been a major location for research into the authorship question and welcomes scholars looking for new evidence that sheds light on the play's origin how this particular man or anyone for that matter could have produced such an astounding body of work is one of, great, one of the great mysteries. Now this is where um, Whitmore got himself in a little bit of trouble. If the current consensus on the authorship of the plays and poems is ever overturned, it will be because new and extraordinary evidence is discovered. The Folger Shakespeare Library is the most likely place for such an unlikely discovery. In other words, I think it could happen, but it ain't going to happen. <laughs> you know, so I think he regretted saying that. He was probably a newbie, a little bit of a newbie still. And I think he got some flack for that. So um, also, there, there's another paragraph. In the century since these claims were first advanced, which claims are not really specified. No decisive evidence has been unearthed proving that the plays were produced by anyone but the man from Stratford-upon-Avon, a man equipped with a very good grammar school 
I just say, have that in quotation marks. I'm like, what? And experience gained working in a professional theater company. Okay, so might have equipped, might have been equipped, or might have gained, or um, are not used. No English lit student or grad student can get away without hedging like this. Um, so, you know, we very find, very often find Stratfordians do things that English teachers aren't supposed to let their students do. Another kind of thing that the Folger has done is people keep changing the hairlines on portraits. We may not really know who this is. Um, it's supposed, we, um, we think it's, some people think it's Thomas Overbury. It's very often trotted out as, the similar ones to this are very often trotted out as Shakespeare. Maybe there's a reason for that, but it's not, be, it's not because it looks like Will, I don't think. We may not really know who this is, actually. Or we may know, we may know exactly who it is. Overbury was discredited and poisoned. Sound possibly familiar? What if this is not Overbury? I talked about the damage to the fold, that the Folger has done to the Ashbourne portrait in my article, Branding the Author. Why do all these altered paintings have altered hairlines? Next slide. That. <laughs> okay, that's the reason. Okay. At some point, they wanted them to look like Shakespeare. Okay. So another thing that the Folger is doing, this is becoming a list of the Folger's sins. I apologize, all, they also do very good things. The, is the Folger method from Folger education. I got in a fight with the Folger representative at the NCTE conference, or the NCTE exhi exhibition about this. And I was like, Wait a minute, where's the author? <laughs> she goes, we don't really talk about the author. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, because you have the wrong guy. And I ran. <laughs> so <laughs> I was afraid I was going to get myself into trouble. Um, but basically, this is kind of peculiar in a way. Shakespeare's language is not a barrier, but a portal. Obviously, people are going to have some time trouble reading it at first, stu young students. I don't, I don't disagree with a lot of this. All students and teachers deserve the real thing. In other words, they're kind of saying they don't like the translation trend. But if you think about that, they're not really giving them the real thing. <laughs> the Folger method is a radical engine for equity, maybe. Uh, give up Shakespeare worship. They need to take their own advice. Throw out themes, tidy explanations, the idea of a single right interpretation. That thing about theme really got the English teacher and me a little mad. The teacher is not the connector or explainer, but rather the architect. What? Amplify the voice of every single student. Yay, that's great. Set students on fire with excitement about literature. Well, they have, there, we know there's a reason why that's sometimes not happening. Okay, so it takes the author out. And just a scholarly note on the Folger and the death of the author. <clears throat> I hope this is from Ron Rosenbaum, the Shakespeare, who wrote the Shakespeare Wars. This is a Stratfordian talking. I hope you saw Richard Wallen's recent essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education on Foucault's previously untranslated later, later lectures which largely repudiated his early critique of subjectivity and by extension, the foundation of the death of the author, critical theology. It should come as a kind of Emily Latella from Saturday Night Live, never mind moment for theory addled American literary scholars. Oh, wise up people, the, the death of the author is dead. <laughs> All right, so um, there's another um, trend. This is Ayana Thompson, who I'm sure is an excellent Shakespeare professor. 
Um, she is one of the, she's on the new, she's one of the new members of the Board of Governors of the Folger. She replaces the real authorship question in the same way that the new Oxford Companion to Shakespeare authorship does um, in her new book, Teaching Shakespeare with Purpose, a student-centered approach. There's nothing wrong with being student-centered, but feeding them stuff that doesn't really help them, doesn't really do that. Um, and they mix it with collaborate, they kind of substitute collaboration theory for the Shakespeare authorship question. I'm not against studying collaboration, but to throw authorship out, this kind of throws authorship out with the bathwater. And it's exactly what um, Gary Goldstein and um, Michael Dudley and I wrote about in our critique of the new Oxford Shakespeare authorship companion. It's not an authorship companion. It's a it's a panning of the authorship question and replaces it with co with collaboration theory. So that's what's going on. I just, just I decided to make a little diagram of the Shakespeare industrial complex. <laughs> we have sort of the parallel things on both sides. We both 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 have institutes. You know, shake the the. Um, the English, the little line in the middle represents the big pond, very minimally. Sorry, it's not the scale. <laughs> um, but you have, the, of course, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, which we, on my, uh, the um, Facebook page that I moderate, we call it Disney Upon Avon. I think I have um, Chris Carillon to thank for that. Um, they have the Oxford Shakespeare, um, I don't really have it on here, but oh yeah, I have the Folger editions. That's the Folger editions of the plays that are sold to thousands of high school students and college students. They're paperbacks, so they're a little cheaper than the Oxford, so they're pretty popular. Um, we have the SSA, they have the British Shakespeare Association, those are the, um, those are the scholarly organizations. Um, they have the Globe, Three, Globe Theater. We have the American Shakespeare Theaters and Festivals. And um, I put Stratford, Ontario on our side because it's on our side of the pond. <laughs> so you can kind of see, this is, a, this is a lot of folks to counter. So if you wonder why we're not out there always confronting these people, we try, but um, can't always cover all these folks. It's a lot of people. Okay. Um, just to name a couple of people who are involved, this is Lena Cohen Orlin, Emeritus Professor of English at Georgetown University. She's kind of up to her neck in the Shakespeare Industrial Complex because she's also an SBT trustee now, and she was um, a director of the Folger Institute, which hands out lots of money to scholars to be good Stratfordians. And she is a Folger Fellow herself. Her new book, The Private Life of William Shakespeare, um, was funded by the, the, her research was funded by the Folger. And I took a quote um, from her own stuff about it. An exhaustive return to the primary sources that document Shakespeare's life, a book that scholar James Shapiro says demolishes shoddy claims and biased inferences that have distorted our understanding of Shakespeare's life. In other words, we sh we, she shows that we know even less about Shakespeare than we thought we did. <laughs> Go, Lena. Okay. Okay. Now, there's also the, the Folio 400 plans. Um, the Folger really can't do much because they may not even be open yet in 2023. They are doing other things, which they're not really revealing yet. It's kind of had, they kind of had 2000, 2023 uh, reopening events and it was blank. So we don't really know exactly what they're doing yet, but they'll do some, they're doing stuff. But they're really putting a lot of help behind the British 
effort, which is shown, this is the banner of the British Folio 400 um, website, which um, the quote is very apt. They're gonna have every, they're gonna throw everything they've got at this. They're gonna have films, a film festival, um, new books, tons of events, a play, a play, um, and this website is kind of the beginning of all that. At least they mentioned Ben Johnson and some other people we, that the Folger doesn't like to talk about. So this is a kind of a cool website. It's got lots of woodcut, cool woodcuts, one for each play, which are pretty, pretty, pretty. So I urge you to go look at that. But I noticed something about their kind of logo for the whole thing. What does the Shandos have to do with the first folio? It's not even in there. So I'm like, okay, it's easier to draw a woodcut of than the draw shout. So, okay, I'll, I'll grant that. Okay, another thing, Emma Smith of Oxford is in charge of the whole first folio 400 extravaganza times, times 10. Um, and this is her new book. Emma Smith has said very nasty things about, about authorship people. Um, if you read her Literature Compass article um, about the authorship question, she's basically said, we're amateurs, we don't know what we're doing, we're not real scholars, we should not be paid attention to. So she's pretty mean. I call her the meanie. <laughs> she's a good scholar, though, in a way. The stuff that Gabe was talking about, she's all, she's all over that. She's a good bibliographer, I'll hand her that. She says very interesting things about the first folio. And she's, pro she's written a pretty good book about the first, her book on the first folio is pretty good. You can learn a lot from her. But she's, she definitely is uh, dyed in the wool strap for you. She's more, she's more bait than Jonathan, Jonathan Bait. <laughs> and she's succeed, she has succeeded him as the queen of British Stratfordians. So, all right, so that's what's going on. I'm gonna leave you with a quote that, that gives me hope a little bit from a very nice person named Kathleen Lynch who worked at the Folger. She was the executive director of the Folger Institute, actually. Um, and she said, the Institute will use its strengths, agilities, and partnerships to exemplify our Folger vision of what it means to do the work of the humanities in this world. That includes making and living our commitments to the values of free and open inquiry. I'm gonna hold them to that. Into the legacies of the past. Give me a couple, a couple glasses of wine and I'll go say anything to, to Michael, Michael Whitmore. So. And I did once. <laughs> I was like, how come you don't take us seriously? With support and guidance from staff around the Folger, we will write more inclusive histories that reach broader audiences, and we will do so with honesty about the exclusions and suppressions of the past. I'm not sure about that. There are suppressions at the Folger. Roger and I have reason to believe that there was possibly a copy of Looney transcribed to Folger. It doesn't exist now, but it was on their card catalog. So we've got to look into that more. We want to take... Um, <laughs> Yeah, we want, to, we want to take some friends with us when we go to work on that <laughs> little gang. <laughs> so, um, across the Folger, we are dedicated to creating more and diverse and inclusive communities. Does that include thought communities as well? So that together we can benefit from multiple perspectives and lived experiences. In these ways, we can envision new futures through explora explorations of the past. It's a beautiful... It's from her retirement speech. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful paragraph, but I'm not sure it applies to us. <laughs> so um, that's the way it is at the Folger. So um, I can answer a few questions if you want.
Is there time for questions? Okay. Um, It's not popular with all, stra all, stra all traditional scholars, but... Um, Shelley, could you repeat the... Oh, yeah, repeat the question. No, so, just like, yeah. say collaboration. Okay, yeah. H how is collabor isn't collaboration kind of a cracking open of the traditional Stratfordian paradigm? A little bit. It's a step, in the, might be a step in the, in, the, in the direction of a little bit of honesty, but... Roger and I like to call this the everybody, kind of the everybody but Oxford theory. Um, that there, and we've always believed that there is a controlling consciousness between all, behind all of the works, that there's a brain. If there are additions by other people, great. You know, they fit in, they were cool, they were friends, so they worked together. And you had Fisher's Folly, the salon, where they could work together and get each other's ideas. So sure, there was some collaboration. And you know, theater is collaborative in nature. So, um, but it's not the end all be all. And it's not quite, it's a, a lot of it is based on faulty, faulty forensic statistics. Some of the conclusions that have been made about collaboration. That, for one thing, they don't even have a control sample for Shakespeare. <laughs> Consider that, yeah, sort of. Roger might have more to say about that if you want to ask him. Okay, let's see. Lucinda. I just wanted to ask about this Kathy Lynch. You said this little quote gave you some hope, but you said it's in her retirement. Yeah, she was retiring, so she could say whatever she wanted, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I hope, you know, if they actually live up to this, you know, we can cart this out and say, look, this is what your former had as the vision for this place, you know. Okay. I had... Um, you may have already thought of this. Have, have you already proposed a Disney analogy? Walt Disney did not write When You Wish Upon a Star. If he was the mastermind, the overseer, and Edward de Vere may have been the same. Right. Parallels between Disney and, Disney and Shakespeare, the, um, de Vere and company. Yeah, um, I've heard I've heard that the people who the people same people I know who talked about Disney on Avon kind of have you may still, have discussed that. You still get credit as the author. Right, right, yeah, yeah, artistic director, etc. Okay. Right. I mean, that's kind of what we acknowledge here. And it seems to me that the text and the emphasis on the um, writing and, and help, helping students understand the words of Shakespeare, um, where he was a, as we heard earlier tonight, he was a wordsmith. And what he was doing was taking passion and action and putting it into words. And I've heard it. It, it can be, yeah, it can be, because, yeah, Cheryl, I'll get you next, sorry. They don't, they don't try to explain it, but they wouldn't even let Roger videotape um, a, some, an interview or something, what were you going to do? And they knew he, you know, they knew he was doing really hot stuff with that book. So they don't want to talk. They, yeah, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want anybody to know about that if they can help it. Okay, Cheryl. Thanks, Shelley. Um, my question is about the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. 
are their activities under the auspices of that Folio 400? Because I know they're doing things like make, minting a coin. Yeah, Do that's you know more about what that's doing? part of the whole. They're part it of that is. whole so thing. Yeah, they're all working together. I the see. industrial complex, you know, the institute. They're, you know, they're 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 going to have an international scholarly conference in Germany because the the folio was announced. Their justification is that the folio was announced at Frankfurt, so they're going to have an international Shakespeare um, scholarly conference. So the universities are involved. Right. Emma's at Oxford. Yeah. You have the institute. And what about the film festival? Is that at Stratford, or do you know anything? <clears throat> they, ha they, didn't, okay. they haven't Great. said. They Thank said you. it would be a black and white one followed by a color one, maybe. That's, okay. that's how <laughs> vague they are about it right now. So we'll see what's going on. Thank you. Keep your eyes on. Keep your eyes on that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions. <laughs>